Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the As They Went podcast, where we share stories of everyday people living everyday lives, but who have made extraordinary changes. I'm your host, Tanya Smith, and I am so excited and honored to hear from today's guest, Mr. James Tate. James is a holistic wellness practitioner um, and the owner of Beyond Weight Loss Total Wellness Center. He's also a certified integrative nutrition health coach, a nutrition therapist, a clinical weight loss practitioner, and sports exercise nutritional advisor. I'm not even done, people. <laughs> He's the ministry leader at the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, where John K. Jenkins Sr. is the pastor. And finally, Last but certainly not least, Mr. Tate is the author of the children's book, The Cool Kids and the Land of the Giants. Welcome, Mr. Tate, to our platform. Hello, Mr. Tate. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank, no, I'm, I thank you for coming through with us. And I can say that um, I honestly believe that God can give a word, a word that's so profound that it changes the lives of not only the um, person that he gives the word to, but those that hear it. And um, I'm just so ex excited for you to come on this evening and share all the knowledge that you have on this subject um, of not just, I think a lot of times we think that church is just church and people don't see how church and everything that involves us that God wants for us goes beyond the walls of the church. So I'm just glad that you're here. Um, okay, would you rather, I wanna, um, would you rather I call you James or Mr. Tate? You can call me James. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that formal at all. Okay, okay. Well, um, James, before we get, started. Um, can you share with our audience what exactly is a holistic wellness practitioner and what led to you being a champion advocating for optimal health and wellness? Sure, sure. So that's a great question. A holistic wellness practitioner is a person that focuses on the wellness of the entire person or the whole person that's mentally, spiritually, emotionally, as well as physically. So when I work with people, my goal is to help people to be fat free in every area of their life. So that's losing the mental fats and the emotional fats, as well as the physical fats. You know, those things that weigh us down mentally and emotionally, because pretty much everything affects your health and wellness in one way or another. And yeah. so that's what that's my goal when working with people, when working with groups is to help them to lose the fat in every area of their life, whatever's weighing them down. Yes. Well, um, I don't know if you know this, but our podcast is based on the scripture, Luke 17 and 14, um, where the lepers call out to Jesus and he said, go. And as they went, they were healed. So we talk about transformation. And in order to have a transformation, people have had to have a story that brought them to that point where they realized they needed transformation. So would you like to share our story of what precipitated you needing the transformation initially? Sure, well, how much time do you have? Because I, I, <laughs> I, I, I have, you need. I have a very, very long story. So I'll give you the, the cliff notes or condensed version okay. for the sake of time. But Growing up in Washington, D.C., I was an overweight child, overweight teenager, overweight adult. I was overweight my entire life. And I was involved in an accident in 2007 that damaged the entire left side of my body. It left me immobile for a year. And I had three years, consecutive years of physical therapy. Now, when I say overweight, in high school, I played football and my playing weight was between 275 to 285 pounds. In college, I was about between three and 330 pounds. And after that year, after my accident, my weight went to over 400 pounds. 
And my doctor told me that my injuries would not heal if I did not lose the weight. Now I've struggled with weight my entire life, so I didn't really think it was possible. And my brother invited me back to church. Now, growing up, I was not a church kid or a church goer, uh, so to speak, but my father made us go to Sunday school. Okay. And so Sunday school was the main thing for us because he wanted us to learn about the Bible, the characters or the people in the Bible, uh, the stories, right. um, everything about the Bible. So we went to Sunday school, but we did not attend church, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. Uh, so my brother invited me back to church, uh, which was the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. And I rededicated my life to Christ, uh, New Year's Eve service, watch night service going into the year 2010. Okay. And the theme for 2010 was beyond, beyond. Mm -hmm. God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. And so I say, God, I need you. This time I'm going to give you all of me and not just pieces of me. You can have all of me. And I need you to take this weight off of me because I need to be healed. Yes. And so we started with the Daniel fast at the beginning of the year. Now, let me tell you, this was the first time I ever fasted in my life. <laughs> yeah. I've, I never fasted. I thought I was going to die just before it <laughs> even started. Uh, Cause I've never gone two days without a chicken wing. In you my know life. what? I want to interject when you, when I heard that this morning, I said, that's a man after God's own heart. I know I'm going to like him. When you said that you had never went two days without a chicken wing, I said, okay, yeah, that's a man after God's own heart. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. You know, I, I almost defeated myself before even starting or even trying because of what I thought it was going to be like. But one of the things through the fast that God showed me was it wasn't food that I can't live without. It's actually him that I can't live without. And so I started to read every scripture about food and about nutrition. And I went into the, the church bookstore. Now, First Baptist is a large church. It's considered a mega church with a large bookstore. Now, this is the first time I ever went into the bookstore and went to the back shelf. And there was only one book on the shelf. I've never seen it before. But when I asked God to give me direction and guidance, I went back there and there was one book on the shelf and it was called, What Would Jesus Eat? And so I purchased that book. I read that book. It had the scriptures that I was already studying. Uh, I started to commit scriptures to memory. And I said, okay, if God says to eat this and not eat that, why don't I follow his word? Because I follow, I'm trying to follow everything else that he tells me to do and not to do. So why am I not following this? And so I started to apply that to my life because after the fast, when I realized I was still alive after the 21 <laughs> days right. and I actually started to feel better. And so I started okay. to incorporate that into my life. And at the end of that year, the Lord blessed me to lose over 200 pounds naturally. Wow, that is amazing. That is amazing. So let me ask you something. Um, it sounds like to me like your obedience is what led to your breakthrough. Yes, yes, yes you, very much so. You know, um, um, in regards to, because I know you just mentioned that you'd lost 200 pounds and I think that's what most people focus on. Um, but in regards to before and after transformation, especially physically, um, many people focus solely on the after right? Um, can you explain to our listeners if and how your transformation process started before you ever took that first step or change your eating habits? I guess what, what I'm getting at is if you agree with the notion that a perspective shift precedes any sustainable transformation, like you have to change, something has to switch in your mind to even, not even if you can't wholeheartedly believe that you can do it, but you have to have faith that it can be done. Yes, yes. So, and that's why I always work to help people to lose fat in every area, because yes. that's, that's what I walk through. I had to lose the mental and the emotional fat first, because what a lot of people don't know and why my story is so long is that I battled depression at that time. I had multiple suicide attempts at that time. Yes. I was uh, addicted to opioids at that time because I've taken every single pill that you can imagine. And so I was dealing with a lot. The weight loss was a gift. 
But in order to have the weight loss, I had to renew my mind, right? So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's a wellness scripture in itself right there. Yes, And then uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So everything starts with the renewing of your mind, mind. Right. right? If you want to lose weight, you have to renew your mind, not your meal plan and your exercise routine. You have to renew your mind. Yes. And so that's something that I had to learn to do was to renew my mind, to give God access to my mind. And so uh, I always, when they say that the body is a temple, you look at the body as a temple. And I, I always say that every single part of your body has a door. And a lot of us, when we come to Christ, we say, okay, we open up the door and say, hey, you can have this, you can have this, but we have some rooms that we keep locked that right. we don't give him access to. And so when I said I gave him access to all of me, that's what I mean. And it has to start with the mind. You have to renew your mind um, towards whatever it is that you want to do and right. make sure that God is your GPS. Let him lead the way and be a lamp to your feet and direct your path and not lean to your own understanding. So that's something that I've really had to do in order to get what eventually became the weight loss, but I had to lose right. the weight in my mind first. Thank you so much. I love, cause you just led into the next segue um, because I feel personally for far too long, the church has been the hub of spiritual growth and the cornerstone of believers faith journeys, right? To unfortunately to the exclusion of relaying a message of total health, spiritual, mental, and physical. Um, however, the word of God is exhaustive in its insight for all of mankind in any and every area of our lives. Do you see what you do through your health and wellness ministry as a calling that God has given you to spread nutritional awareness? And what role does the church, do you believe the church can play in um, sp spreading a message to its members of overall health? Okay, that's a great question. So I am also a, a health minister. I, I finished a uh, certificate program at Wesley Seminary in Washington, D.C., and my assignment from God is to educate his people, yes, to motivate, sir. educate, and inspire his people to live a holy and healthy life. And so while I was um, going through everything, God spoke to me. He said, I did not take this weight off of you for vanity. I want you to go and educate my people. And he took me to the book of Hosea. And in Hosea, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so he said, I'm, I'm going to use you to educate my people. And so through that uh, certificate program, I had to interview a lot of churches and a lot of pastors and uh, churches across the country. And the number one prayer request in churches across America is for something health related. Health related. And but yet we preach about everything except health. You can go to any church and they'll read the scriptures and it will, they will talk about how uh, God has taught us how to be a good person or a good steward, how to manage your money, how to pick and love a spouse, how to work on your job, how to raise your children. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. But he also gave us instructions on how to take care of our bodies as well. Um, as a child, I was told the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. But for some reason, we, we treat the Bible like trail mix. We take out our favorite pieces and we throw the rest of it away. And what we end up throwing away are those health and wellness scriptures. And so what I do is I go to churches, I speak to church leaders. Um, I also speak in the community, but I educate people about those scriptures and what God means by it. And right. it's not to punish us, but it's for our good. And so- yeah. We have to look at it, renew our mind to what we think about health, wellness, and nutrition, and also what God is trying to uh, prevent um, with, when it comes to certain foods and certain drinks that we have, because 
Um, many of the diseases that we suffer from today are caused by poor food choices. So we can actually live healthy lives if we just do what God tells us to do. That is so true. That, that is so true. Um, I, I, I love your perspective because I think oftentimes people will divorce the spiritual from the secular as though they have no influence on one another and a lot of you know and it can in many areas of life it doesn't mean that it has to be either or right so the announcement to eat right generally falls flat or on deaf ears for many because proponents of that way of thinking don't address the emotional connection that many of us including myself have associated in our minds when it comes to food or eating how do we retrain our minds to one of food as fuel that can have the added benefit of being enjoyable instead of food being enjoyable as the primary motivator for why we eat yeah so one the thing with that is is that you have to always get to the root cause of every issue or every problem one of the things that i see is that we continue to put band-aids on open wounds we try to to heal but we don't get to the root cause and so when you whenever someone struggles with being overweight or overeating or anything in um, health and wellness I always try to get to the root cause of that issue. Um, why do we do what we do? And it's very, very important to ask those questions. And you'll realize that a lot of people eat the way that they eat because number one, they've been taught that way. Uh, another thing is that it's sentimental. It helps them to hold on to somebody who has passed on or somebody that they miss. And so, you have to really get to the root cause of a certain issue. And with the church, the church, we actually, unfortunately, and it, it, it breaks my heart because we cause more damage when it comes to health and wellness. Yes. So you think about it, someone will go into the doctor and the doctor will say, hey, you have diabetes. And the first thing we say is the devil is a lie, Liar. <laughs> right? I'm not claiming that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not claiming that. That's from the pit of hell and all those type of things. But yet, we, um, we continue to consume the foods that fuel those diseases. And if you go to a lot of churches, a lot of churches we have, you know, you sell the dinners after service, you have a, 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 a candy table where you're selling candy and things like that. And so we really have to renew our minds to how we look at health and wellness, because we, if a person that struggles with alcoholism comes into the church, we don't, they don't leave with a shot of liquor. Right. Or if a drug addict comes in, we don't give them drugs as they leave. Exactly. But when we have food addicts and people that are struggling with sickness, illness and diseases coming to the church, it's fine to leave with candy and fried foods and 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 overly salted foods and things like that. But I think it another component of it is just the lack of education, the lack of knowledge. And our people are being destroyed for it because we haven't been taught. Um, about food and about the the healing benefits of certain foods and what other foods are doing to damage our temples. And so that's another part of the knowledge, but also helping people get to the root cause of why they do what they do. Thank you so much for that. Okay, I was fortunate enough to watch the video you did, which was a Bible study in May of 2020, right in the height of the quarantine. Um, I th think it was, which I would strongly recommend to anyone listening to go over to YouTube and watch that video. He has so much information. It would just bl blow your mind. Um, and one of your very first statements was addressing that when you pray to God seeking help for your weight issue, he first addressed your spiritual condition. Not that he dismissed the weight, but first he placed it on your heart to get to a place spiritually where you could hear him clearly it reminded me of the paralyzed man whose friends brought him to jesus and jesus says to him your sins are forgiven can you speak to to our audience about how god is primarily concerned with the state of our eternity 
before he addresses what is in essence a temporary issue. Not that it's not important to him because if God is concerned about the number of hairs on our hair, that he's concerned with the totality of our being. But why do you think um, he, go he goes out of his way to address our spiritual condition first? Yeah, that's very, very important, the spiritual condition, because, you know, he wants us to live with him. We're supposed to, he, you know, we want, should want to go to heaven. And with it, when it comes to our bodies, you have to, when we talk about renewing of the mind, we have to look at our body for what it is. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And if, and if our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, we have to have a clean place for the Holy Spirit to reside. And that plays a point of a major, major part into our spiritual health, because if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is holy. We want to make sure that we give him a clean, holy home. And in order to have a holy home for the Holy Spirit, our spiritual uh, part has to be right. It has to be strong. It cannot be weak, weak and it cannot be sick. So we want to make sure that we focus on that first and foremost. Um, the analogy that I used uh, earlier when I talked about the fat. And so with physical fat, if you think about physical fat and how it builds up in the body, it can build up in the body based off of what we eat and how much stress we have, and it blocks the blood flow throughout the body. And if the blood cannot flow freely throughout the body, we get sick and we can die. But when I talk about mental and emotional fast, that's anything that's blocking the blood of Christ from flowing freely in our life. And if we don't work on losing those fats, and if without that blood flow, we get sick and we die. And so it's very, very important that we focus on the spiritual part first. And that way we can hear what God is telling us to do and what he wants us to do. Because what he tells me to do to get my body in order may not be what he tells you to do. Right. Right. Because health looks different on everybody. I know people show pictures of people and you look at their body and it looks like God chiseled them himself, right? But that doesn't mean that they're healthy. And so my, my version of healthy or the way that I look being healthy may look different than everybody else that's under the sound of my voice. But as long as we allow God into our hearts and we work on the spiritual man and our spiritual man is strong, then everything else will fall into place. That is the most important thing for us to work on. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate, I, I love, and I think it's so necessary how you don't do it separately in your teaching. It's like you paint a picture where all of us is, all of our inner man is intricately connected to the next part. And I think a lot of times people think, well, let me, I may fix this area of my life. So they fix, you know, and with total disregard to the rest of their um, life. I, I think that happens, it's, it's, especially to a lot of people, they want to build up their, um, get their health in a much better place than it is. But I noticed from shows like My 600 Pound Life and things like that, it always concerns me that they'll have people start the process and then after they fail they introduce the mental health component instead of introducing that at the beginning like yeah you know i'm thinking if you know this is the likelihood then why don't you just do it like you use the word a holistic approach from the beginning so okay um i read an interview and that you did i think it was in the washington times or the washington post and one of the many statements you made that stood out to me was this, healthcare starts in the kitchen. Can you expound on that for our audience, please? Yeah, so when it comes to healthcare and, and health, we always look outside our home. Healthcare starts in your kitchen. And so if you want to be healthy, I always tell people, if you want to be healthy, you have to eat more at home than you do outside the home. And when I say more at home, that does not mean bringing food from the outside <laughs> into the home. I and guess is, <laughs> feel people say it in the audience now, they're like, oh man, I thought I could just run through a drive through <laughs> No, no, not the drive through um, You have to go to the grocery store and you have to 
prepare most of your meals. It's very, very important that we do that because you know what you're putting in your food. I always tell people that your body can burn calories, but it cannot burn chemicals. Mm -hmm. And when we eat outside of the home, some of those foods, majority of those foods have so many chemicals in them. And we wonder why we are suffering from a lot of the diseases that we suffer from that people did not suffer from 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, so a lot of times I hear my grandma ate fried chicken and she lived to 95. So you can't tell me not to eat fried chicken. Well, them, gra them chickens that grandma ate are much different than the chickens that we eat now. Hello. Um, the breading is much different. The oil is much different. And that comes with knowledge. But if you want to improve your health, you have to start in your kitchen, in your home. Very important to do that. And with that, once you commit to doing that and knowing what you put in your food, even if you don't know how to cook, you start with something simple. And you go from there and you build upon that. And I always tell people to get with the family, get with the best cook of your family. And right. if that person is, is cooking, ask questions. Well, why do we use this ingredient? Why do we use that? And, you know, cook together. When, when people say the gatherings are around food and food brings people together, the cooking of the food should bring people together as well. Exactly. And, and involve the children in it too, because it's very important to get involved in the preparation of the meals, not just the, cons the consumption of the meals. Thank you so much for that. And I think too, uh, with the video that I saw of you, you, you were talking about how the majority of what you eat should come from the perimeter of a grocery store rather than the shelves of the grocery store. And I think people, People, most people would do better if they knew better, right? So can you explain to our audience what the difference between the perimeter of the grocery store and the shelves of the grocery store is and the key to that to good, good health? Yeah, so I always tell people that life is on the perimeter and death is in the aisles. Oh, I love majority, that quote. Can majority. you repeat that again? <laughs> repeat it, please. <laughs> Life is on the perimeter and death is in the aisles. Okay. And so when you, majority of the grocery stores are laid out the same way. As soon as you walk through the door, you're going to be greeted with those Genesis 129 foods. And Genesis 129 is the first dietary law that God gave to us. Uh, see that I've given you every fruit that yields seed, um, every herb that shall be your food. And in some translations, it says that shall be your meat. So the first dietary law that God gave was for us to eat fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, but fruits and vegetables that have seeds in them, because God said, I made the fruits and vegetables that have seeds. Nowadays, everything's seedless. So I don't know who's making that, but God says that he makes the seeded things. But when you walk into the grocery store, you're, you're met with those Genesis 129 foods. And then you shop on the perimeter of the grocery store. And those are things that have a short shelf life because they're refrigerated. And if you leave them outside of the refrigerator or the freezer, they're going to spoil. Now, your food should go bad. If your food can go bad, it's good for you. If it cannot go bad, it's bad for you because that means it's loaded with chemicals. So when you get to the aisles, those shelf-stable foods, those foods don't go bad for years at a time. Yes. It means they're loaded with a lot of chemicals. And so if you eat more Genesis 129 foods and foods from the perimeter of the grocery store, those will help to improve your health rather than loading up on the processed foods in the aisles. The goal is to make sure that your refrigerator looks more like a garden and less like a morgue. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That, that, that is so insightful. Yes. Like I was saying, I think many people if they knew better, they would do better, or they feel, I think we've been, people get tossed a lot of information. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do that, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, it's left to them to somehow figure it out. Well, at the Viage Cares this month, we're focusing on self-control. And I feel like, um, it's unfortunate because people feel as though somehow they have to, people who struggle with any type of illness, especially weight, you know, 
weight loss or being morbidly obese, that it's all within them to somehow conjure up this self-control to not do what goes against their health. But far too often they fail or they're not able to maintain a certain level of self-control to reach their goals. So they end up feeling like a failure. Can you speak to how, when you work with clients, um, where, where does self-control come in and what do you advocate for as far as self-control measures when you're trying to, you know, it's like you don't want to, you want to eat the cookies, but you know, you shouldn't eat the cookies, but it's, it's almost like, so just put this in those like everyday terms. What can people do to help them improve their self-control? So self-control is a funny, funny thing to me, because if we had self-control, which means we will be able to control ourselves, which doesn't happen. And so one of the great things about being a health minister or a, uh, a Christian holistic wellness practitioner is that I have to point people to lean on Christ, not lean on self. So a lot of people will say you need self-control, self-control. There is no self-control. We, we have to give God access to us to help us and to show us how he wants us to control the situations that are around us. And everybody's looks different. And so the thing is, is that the goal is to point people, push people to Jesus Christ and not focus on self. We have the world telling people to focus on self. I did this. I did that. Um, willpower and all those type of things. Well, we know our help comes from the Lord. And so one of the, another thing that I, um, one of my goals is, is to allow, tell people to allow God into your wellness program or into what it is that you want to do. We go to God for everything else. We pray about everything else. But one of the things that I see is that we don't pray about our bodies. We don't pray about our health and our wellness um, we run to YouTube University, but we don't run to the Bible to see what God has to say about it. And, you know, some people know some of the wellness scriptures and they say, oh, that's for the Old Testament. That's not for today. But if God said it, it's for a reason. Like I said, don't treat the Bible like trail mix. Read it and know what God says. And if he says it, it's, he says it for a reason. So, my whole goal is to point people to God, not lean on self-control or try to control it yourself. Because if you had self-control, quote unquote, right. you, you would have been able to control it right. a long time ago. But the goal is to know who you are and whose you are. Mm -hmm. And once you know your value, I always tell people, know your worth. And because a lot of people, especially Christians, they don't know their worth. And I know somebody's like, well, I know my worth, but this is what I mean by that is that the human body is a multi-million dollar machine that God has loaned to you. Doesn't matter how long your hair is or how short it is. It doesn't matter your complexion, your height, or your weight. You are a multi-million dollar machine. And if you don't believe me, go to any surgeon and ask that surgeon, how much does it cost to replace your knees or to replace your hips right. or to fix every single bone in your body? We already know how much how much people pay for haircuts and hairdos. So you already know it's a multi-million dollar machine that God has loaned to you because you are not your own, as the scripture says. So if you drove a million dollar car, what type of fuel would you put in it? The How would you? That's the very best, best grade I possibly could, yeah. Right, right. You will put the best fuel in it. You will treat it because you know the value of it. You yes. were treated well, you were protected. So when you know the value of something, you protect it. Right. But most of us don't understand or even know what our value is. And so if God has loaned you a multi-million dollar vessel to do what he has called you to do, how are you fueling it? How are you taking care of it? How are you protecting it? And so when you know your worth, and you know who you are and whose you are, you tend to take better care of it. And so you want to make sure that you put as much 93 octane fuel into your body, which will help you to fight disease and to keep you healthy. 
But when I say food is fuel, you want to put the fuel into your body to go where God is trying to take you and to do what he has called you to do. Thank you. So that is so insightful. And I don't think people, when you made the statement, how much the human body, you know, is, is worth, I don't think people think of that. I was listening to something like you said, when I was doing my research and you said that you made us a, a prof like it's, I was driving down the road and it made me like well, one of those aha moments. And you said that like you use the thing of a car, say if you had a Rolls Royce, and you would take it to the Rolls Royce dealership and you would do everything because you would fully understand its value. Yet if someone would give you a cheeseburger, fries, ice cream, um, this, that, and the third, and a, and, and a Coke for $3.99, you would see that as a good value, right? But that's in right. the grand scheme of things, that's the worst value, you, you know? So I, I, I think it's, it just goes along with retraining the way that people think about themselves and about food and 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 in general. Yeah, and just just back to the car analogy, like you mentioned with the Rolls Royce. If you were in possession of or the owner of a Rolls Royce, you wouldn't take it to a Ford or Chevy dealer to get it fixed, even right. though they may be able to help you but you will feel more comfortable taking it to the people that know it inside and out, which is the mechanic that specifically works on that type of car. And so where we get in trouble is, is that Jesus is sitting there with his arms open wide, waiting for us to bring our issues to him, but yet we take them to everybody else. And so God is like, you're in position of this multi-million dollar vehicle that needs maintenance that needs fixing, but yet you're not coming to me and I created it to ask me the best way to fix it or to heal it. And so oh, I oh, always oh, tell yeah. people, take everything to God in prayer. When it says take everything to God in prayer, you that means everything. everything, every single thing, because this human body that we have that God has given us, for many of us is gonna be the most expensive thing that we ever possess. And so when you think about that, you want to take care of it, but you also want to make sure that you take it in for its routine maintenance. Uh, and, and you go to God. He gave us the instruction manual, the Bible. And so you want to make sure that you read the entire book and see the advice and the instructions that God gives on how to take care of this multi-million dollar vessel. That is so, that just leads, everything you say, just lead, one question, just lead, everything you say just leads into the next thing. And um, so the next thing I want to say, I want to actually speak to listeners who struggle with being overweight. This is my question to you, um, James. It seems that overweight people are caught between the alternate realities of shame and acceptance, right? In many ways, especially among African Americans, being overweight is embraced. Yet society at large frowns upon it for reasons far beyond our health. It's like a judgment is attached. From your perspective, how can an overweight person recognize that change is necessary while not hating who they are now. I love how you phrase that question because the most important thing is what you said at the end, not hating who you are now. Yeah. You have to, like I said, you have to know who you are and whose you are. Love yourself now because God loves you. And it's very important to love yourself. So one of the things that I do when I, when I work with clients and I speak to groups and churches, I used to, I would hold up a mirror and I would ask people, what do you see? I want you to write and I'll tell me what you see and I write down what they see. And then I say, tell me what you like and tell me the things that you don't like. What you see, tell, when you see, what you see, tell me what you like about what you see and what you don't like what you right. see. And so then, and it's all part of the mind renewal process. 
And then, you know, I would ask them, name me five or 10 things that you love. And usually people will tell me the things that they love and they rarely will list themselves in that list. And then I would say, okay, imagine if you wake up tomorrow and God only gives you the things that you thanked him for the day before. And so I wanna have people to have an attitude of gratitude. And I know that's used a lot in the world, but it's not with a God focus, with okay. Christ as at the center of it. Because we take a lot of things for granted. Sure, there are things that I don't like about my body, but the thing that I do is I praise God for everything that works. Right. And so your pros will always outweigh your cons. And here's an example. When I was in physical therapy after my accident, there was a guy in, in the physical therapy because in physical therapy, they were like 10 different hospital beds. Right. And when I would go down there, there was always a guy in a, in a wheelchair. And he would always ask me every single day, young man, what is wrong? Young man, what is wrong? And I, at that time, I, was, <laughs> I did not want to hear from him. <laughs> I would try to avoid them. And eventually I answered them. I said, my left side doesn't work. He said, but does your right side work? And I'm like, man, I don't think you hear me. My left side doesn't work. And he said, but does your right side work? And he said, do you know what I would give to have one side that works? And he was a double amputee. He always had a blanket over his, his lower half. And I would love to say that, you know, a light bulb went off and God spoke to me right then and there. I dismissed it. it but I, it, I, yeah, I always, <laughs> I always, time. I always remember him because towards the end of my stay, the nurses would tell me he was the meanest person there and he would never speak to anybody. So God used him to speak life into me, but it didn't take root then. Right. So one of the things I want people to, to realize is that you have a lot of great things about you. It doesn't matter how much you weigh or what that number says on the scale. That number just tells you your gravitational pull. But there are so many great qualities about you and so much that you have been blessed with that you cannot focus on what you think is negative about you because you have so many positive and great things about you. So what I will say to the listeners is, Imagine if you wake up tomorrow and God only gives you what you thanked him for today. And so you, you want to start getting specific with your praises and your gratitude. So you want to thank God for your eyes working, for your ears working, to be able to have all of your senses so that you can experience him in every which way possible, that you have running water, you have lights that work. Um, because if I don't thank him for it, I may not get it tomorrow. And so next thing you know, you've already thanked God for hundreds of things. And it now overshadows the one or two things that you've been focused on that you think are negative in your life. And it changes your perspective about life because then you, it's like you go out of your way to look for things to be grateful for instead of looking for what's wrong. It just exactly. changes. Yeah, it, that's it, all it, part it, of the renewing of the mind. Right. Wow. Wow. Because that's, a, I was, I was about to, um, Shay, I was about to ask you, um, how difficult is it for you to convince clients that the number on the scale isn't the real issue? And what part does mental health, which is a necessary component for good health, play in that? Do you find a lot of pushback with that? Do like you find... What I guess I'm asking is that people may come to you for weight loss. This is what I want to do. Like they have a goal in mind. This is what I want. And at what point during the process do you think it clicks with them that this is about more than just a number on a scale? So <clears throat> that's a multiple part question. So I'll, I'll start with this. The most difficult people that I have found for it to click with are Christians. The people in the world, they get it right away. And one, one way that I see that is because when I learned nutrition or when I was taught nutrition, it was never from a Christian. Everything that I learned about nutrition was from uh, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, five percenters, Hebrew Israelites, 
everything other than, you know, Christians. But everything that they taught me was in the Bible, which was so shocking to me that Christians, myself included, we have the hardest time grasping that wellness concept when everybody in the world is already following what God has said to do. And so there is a quote by Jordan S. Rubin that I use all the time. He's the author of The Maker's Diet. And he said, he says that, imagine if you wake up tomorrow and you turn on the TV and there's a breaking news report and it says, Christians are the world's healthiest people with less obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, and cancers than anybody in the world. He says, imagine the additions that we would have to build onto our churches when that comes out. And he says, in that day, we would truly be the city on a hill, a light in a dark world. And so, because everybody in the world is looking for some type of wellness. Right. And we are to be the city on the hill, right? Whose light cannot be dim. And I truly believe that once we get our health in order, there's nothing that can stop us. And so, Everybody in the world is so quick to grasp the concept of wellness, but for some reason, we are the hardest nut to crack, so to speak. So when I when I go to when I'm invited to churches and I teach classes in churches, people are very dismissive. They don't want to hear it. Um, I'm fine. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. He's going to heal me. Um, but I always tell people, God will always do the supernatural but we have to do the natural. He's already told us what to do. And so when we don't do it, you know, to know, to know what to do and not do it is sin. Right. Um, one of the issues is that we don't know what to do, but then when we are taught what to do, we're like, nah, that's not for today. There's so much re resistance yeah. to it. And it yes. goes back to what you said earlier. My people die from lack of knowledge and there's a resistance i somehow feel that in a lot of ways it's cultural too um because we're raised in cultures that i think any type of change is hard um but there are certain cultures where change is even met with even more resistance than others and i don't know what that speaks to but I just it's think by that. design. It's actually by design. So if you think about it, the first sin ever committed had to do with people not being disciplined over what they eat. Wow. It's the it's oldest, like, it's the oldest exactly. trick in the book. Wow. It's the oldest trick in the book, literally, to get you to eat the wrong thing. Because at First Baptist, our mission and vision is developing dynamic disciples through discipleship, discipline, and duplication. But when you ask somebody to define dynamic disciple, rarely is health mentioned. You cannot be a dynamic disciple without your health. And so we're still falling from the enemy's oldest trick to when he convinces us to eat the wrong thing, because a healthy Christian is a dangerous, dangerous Christian to <laughs> Satan and whatever he's trying to do, because you'll think clearly, you're able to move you can sing better yeah you're, you're not sweating a bucket when you're up there preaching uh and there's so I mean, much this is so profound and i don't think people and this is what's crazy it's so simplistic that it's profound yeah it's it's so it's like when you think about it, it's like well that makes perfect sense but we, i don't know why we get so distracted from it in our everyday lives um because it's not the focus um, you know, we, we've been, we focus on everything else, unfortunately. And if you are, if, if you're healthy, you can be a better single, you can be a better spouse. Right. You can, you're able to work your job or your career better. Yes. Um, you'll be able to better manage your money because we spend a lot of money on health care and sick care right. on things that are totally preventable. Yeah. And so a healthy Christian is a much better Christian. And you are able to carry out the assignments that God has given you 
even better if you're healthy. Go therefore and make disciples. And if you're healthy enough to go therefore, then you can definitely <laughs> go therefore. Yes. But like I said, we have been falling for the oldest trick in the book. And he convinces us that a lot of these foods that are not good for us are good for us. Right. I was going I was just thinking as you were speaking and what came to me was that in a lot of ways, I will use myself for an example because weight loss is something that I've struggled with for years, but in a lot of ways, I think it speaks to the re the resistance that we exhibit to change, to change our minds, to change our, our way of eating, it shows a lack of faith. That's what it's rooted in. Ultimately, somewhere in us, we believe that we can't do it. So we don't even try. And we convince ourselves that it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah. I, I think ultimately it's a lack of faith. And that's probably why God has to address our spiritual condition before he takes us on that. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then another thing is, is when I tell people not to focus so much on the scale, yes. um, I always recommend that people, you know, get their physicals and their blood tests, mm -hmm. right? So you want to make sure that you're, make sure that you're normal in your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your diet, your uh, glucose and, and triglycerides and things like that. The scale never tells the whole story. Right. I want people to be healthy. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, my goal is not to get people to be a size two or four. Right. It's to help people, number one, to get closer to Christ and involve Christ in your wellness, but also to be as healthy as you can be. Thanks, James. You've shared some very valuable information on holistic health integration. And I truly believe someone listening will be inspired by your story of transformation. Folks, thank you again for joining us today. We trust you've been enriched by the information you've received. Always remember Luke 17, 14. It's as they went, they were healed. We pray God's grace for your obedient diligence to go wherever God leads you to go. Trust me when I tell you, Taking that very first step begins the process. As you go, as you walk it out, just like James, you will be healed and have your own story of transformation. That's our show for today, everyone. Join us next Monday for another episode of the As They Went podcast.